Good evening. Good evening. What a crowd. So I'll say that the reason we're having this event tonight is because you were such a great crowd last time that they specifically asked to come back to the Richmond Library. So thank you. So I am Lee Snellgrove, I'm Arts and Culture Manager here at Richland Library, and we are so excited to have this event tonight um, to celebrate this new book, The First Ladies, this beautiful book. Hopefully you've gotten your copy. Uh, All Good Books is out there selling, so please stop by and get as many copies as you can tonight. <laughs> Uh, so we want to welcome our authors here tonight. I want to say also a few, a few words of thanks um, to a few different groups. Uh, I want to first of all thank All Good Books for being here and selling our books tonight. Um, we're excited. <laughs> Columbia has a really great independent bookstore now, finally. So thanks to them. Um, this is part of a book tour, um, and uh, it, but we're really uh, pleased to be able to have this event tonight thanks to our uh, Richmond Library Friends and Foundation. Um, so we want to thank any board members or uh, donors that are here tonight and recognize them. So please just either stand up or raise your hand if you are a donor to the Friends and Foundation or a board member. It's because of support like that that we're able to have these kinds of exciting events um, and, and celebrate authors and have innovative stuff at Richland Library. So um, thank you to all of you that donate. Um, uh, and so I'll do a quick intro and then hand it right off. Um, Victoria Christopher Murray is an acclaimed author with more than one million books in print. Uh, she has written more than 20 novels, including Stand Your Ground, a NAACP Image Award winner for Outstanding Fiction, and a Library Journal Best Book of the Year. She holds an MBA from the NYU Stern School of Business. And Marie Benedict is a lawyer with more than 10 years' experience as a litigator. A graduate of Boston College and the Boston University School of Law, she is a New York Times and USA Today best-selling author of The Only Woman in the Room, the Mystery of Mrs. Christie, Carnegie's Maid, The Other Einstein, and Lady Clementine all have been translated into multiple languages. She lives in Pittsburgh with her family. And so without further ado, Victoria Christopher Murray and Marie Benedict. We're not super tech savvy, in case you couldn't tell. We have a little favor to ask before we begin. We, again, not being very tech savvy, have recently discovered panorama pictures. <laughs> <laughs> and we love them. So if you guys don't mind, we know they've been around since. We're going to try to our second one. Will you hold up your books, if you have them, and we're going to panorama you. Okay? I know this is like from 1992, but anyway, <laughs> we think we're really cool. Come here we go. Woo! Yeah, you, can you look something? Oh, I can't see it. Yeah, it doesn't have to be silent. I just hope it's like working, because it doesn't do anything. Because we don't really know what it would do. <laughs> <laughs> I got it. <laughs> See? She's. Yay, yeah, Victoria! Good job. If my teenage boys were here, they would just be like, oh, boy. But hi, everyone. Hi! Thank you so much for having us back. And I know Victoria always thinks she doesn't need a mic, but. Because she's from New York and has a loud voice. But I'm going to say yes this okay. time. Oh, yeah. Is it on? It okay. is, okay. yeah. Um, so thank you so much for having us back. Well, you are one of our favorite stops on our personal librarian tour. It was just, just a magical library, patrons, librarians, readers. It was really wonderful. And so we specifically requested you guys to follow our tour. Yeah. 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 
so tonight we are going to take you deep into the world of these incredible friends, Eleanor Roosevelt and Mary McLeod Bethune, who, as you know, grew up not that far from here, right? Um, this important multi-layered story of friendship um, across races um, is the story of a friendship that literally changed the course of history. Um, and it is a tale that we hope and believe is both historic and modern. It has so much for us to be inspired by and um, and to learn from. Um, so we're going to introduce you and welcome you. Do you see my sister over here is pushing this on me because this tech savvy one over here is going to be in charge of this. I'm really sorry for you guys, but welcome to the world of the first ladies. And we're going to start with Mary McLeod Bethune. And you know what I loved? When we were here before, we had been on tour for the Personal Librarian. I think you may have heard about that little book. And you, this was the only place where we talked about Mary, where people cheered. Like in most other places, they were like, Woo, huh? and we were so excited. We said, we got to go back there because they know her. Um, but let's start with Mary McLeod Bethune, who everyone here knows was born in Maysfield, South Carolina. You also probably already know that she was the 15th of 17 children. But here's what's so interesting about that. She was the first child born free. The very first one born free. So that's right, we have some of Dr. Bethune's descendants here with us this evening. <laughs> The first, yeah, the, but she was the first one born free. And what is so interesting about her is that she grew up on the plantation where her parents and her siblings had been enslaved. So she grew up from the humblest of beginnings. Her father had built that cabin. And even though this, this was her beginnings, she wanted to be educated. Like at the age of nine or 10, a little girl told her, you can't read, you cannot read, you're not allowed to read. And from that moment, she wanted to be educated. And so she did everything that she could, talked her parents into letting her go to school. They couldn't allow her to go all the time because she worked on the plantation. But whenever she went, she just became a good student ended up going to college, ended up even going to school after that. And education was so important to her that once she was educated, she started a school for young black colored girls at the time with just $1.50. Now, I understand that there's a lot that has happened with inflation since then, <laughs> but $1.50 is still $1.50. I don't care when that happened. And so she started a school that within one year had over 200 students there on campus, and education was just one of the most important things to her. Now, she ran up against a lot of things. As I said, financially, she started with such a small amount, but she also ran up to these, ran into these people. They marched on her campus with those girls on campus twice. They did not want her educating the students. They did not want her registering their parents to vote and she stood up to them both times. They just totally would march and think they could stop her. This is the, her home on, it is presently on Bethune-Cookman's campus. I had a chance to go down there and visit, so I even saw like the Life magazine spread out on the table. And she lived there, she was, lived in one of the best homes for colored people at that time with indoor plumbing and everything. Um, and this is her picture on Bethune-Cookman's campus that stands today as one of the top HBCUs in the country. In Daytona, in Daytona, I think there must be some BCU graduates in here. That's what I'm talking about. Mary McLeod Bethune traveled the world. Equality, education, all of that was very important to her because she recognized that education was the great equalizer. 
And that was her number one thing, was to get people trained and educated. And one of the things that she did, she was also a member of the best sorority in the world, Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. There's a few. So and so, I mean, I, you know, I'm, I apologize, but the best sorority in the world. There are a few of your. And then she was also the um, founder of the greatest woman's organization because she got all of us working together. And today, over 4 million women from various organizations work with the National Council of Negro Women. And so, so many of us stand on her shoulders. So that is just the beginning with Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune. I mean, we could take our whole time today just to talk about her individual accomplishments, but we're also going to explore the accomplishments that she had with this woman. Do you guys know who she is? <laughs> um, usually, of course, people are more familiar with Eleanor Roosevelt because she was the first lady, although you might not be as familiar with her looking as she did as a young woman. This is her when she was about 18 years old. Um, and I like to think that the dramatic change in appearance is also emblematic of the dramatic change in who she was from the beginning of, um, of her young adulthood into her adulthood as well. Um, Eleanor, um, while she certainly had a much more wealthy um, and privileged background and upbringing than Mary did. Um, it was not an upbringing that was um, brimming with love and affection, for sure. Um, her parents, she was Eleanor Roosevelt before she became Eleanor Roosevelt, right? Um, and her, um, her parents were part of the elite of uh, New York at the time. They were very wealthy. Um, but her mother, really, this is really terrible to say, but really did not have a loving relationship with Eleanor. She was very critical of Eleanor. And her mother died when she was quite young. Eleanor was beloved by her father. Um, her father was the brother of Teddy Roosevelt. Um, and her father, while he loved her, he was a really quite a sick man. He was a desperate alcoholic in a time period when there really wasn't proper treatment. And um, he also died when she was quite young. And Eleanor and her brother ended up kind of ping-ponging around to a variety of, re of relatives. She never ended up having really a home of her own. She was always kind of under a, a guest in someone else's house. Teddy Roosevelt was probably her closest relative, the one who looked out for her the most. He was obviously president of the United States when she was a teenager and a young woman. So he was a little busy right during that time um but all of this kind of um coalesced to put Eleanor on a very traditional path from her young adulthood. She was sort of brimming with all of these desires to fight for social causes and social justice as it stood at the time. But this, this un, sort of loveless upbringing she had really made her crave having a family of her own. And from she ended up, of course, marrying this man, FDR, who, yes, he was her cousin. I know that's gross. <laughs> He was not her first cousin. He was like her second cousin once removed or her third cousin, something like that. So it's just a little bit gross, not like super disgusting. She really loved him. She really did. And um, what is about to happen um, changes her life, breaks her heart, um, but also puts her on a different, more important path. Um, so when they were young, this is them, of course, as a young couple, he was in politics. He was the assistant secretary of war. He held several um, roles in state government at the time. Um, and during these years, this was his pre-polio years, there was another person in their marriage, and that was his mother. <laughs> I, might, I don't know if you can see the body language and facial expressions <laughs> in this particular picture, but I, I think I could probably just leave it up there and you get it, right? Yeah. Eleanor, um, she had an omnipresent 
mother-in-law. Um, she really believed that her role was right there alongside her only child, interfering um, in their marriage, in their parenting, in their lives in every possible way. Um, and that created friction early on. But it was this person who really caused problems. This is the fourth person in their marriage. It's a little bit crowded in there. Um, this is Lucy Mercer. Um, some of you may be familiar with her. She was a good friend of Eleanor's. She was her social secretary, which is a role that a lot of uh, young women who came from kind of connected elite families, but had been come down in their luck in terms of financials, um, they fulfilled this role. But Lucy took on another role, and that was FDR's lover. Isn't that nice? So Eleanor was doubly betrayed by this, this multi-year torrid affair that they had, and she discovered when she found um, a little beribboned uh, group of lo love letters between the two of them, right? Really nice. Um, and she was absolutely devastated. And I tell you this because this was the pivotal transformative moment in Eleanor Roosevelt's life. It was at this moment she decided she was not going to be a traditional wife. She was going to return to the passions of her youth for social justice, and she was going to get, take charge of her future. <laughs> Nobody else is shadow for Eleanor anymore. <laughs> I'm sorry, I have to do that, and I love it so much. <laughs> Not your typical picture from the time of a woman. Um, Eleanor, at this point in her life, at, um, at this at this time, FDR had succumbed to polio, which you probably know. He had he had retreated from the public sphere. He was working on walking again, which we'll talk a little bit about later. And Eleanor was free to pursue her own interests and causes. She um for, she co-owned a uh, progressive school for girls in New York called the Todd Hunter School. She taught there as well. She became involved in social uh, movements and in politics. She was a Democrat. She was very much in kind of raising awareness around um, women voting and getting women involved in the political process. She, I think I described how much she enjoyed being with Sarah. And the, on the Roosevelt family estate in New York, where they all lived in one house together, that became a little tight for Eleanor. And so she built a cottage on the property. I mean, it's not really a cottage. It's like a mini mansion. But anyway, um, <laughs> this mini mansion, she lived in with two of her friends, one of whom ran the Todd Hunter School with her, and the other was very involved in democratic politics. And they created a furniture business um, in which they had young men from their community who were unemployed trained in the art of carpentry and they they employed them and ran this somewhat successful furniture business um and here you see her stumping for politi politicians that she liked um but here's sarah again she can never escape sarah and uh, but the one area in which sarah and eleanor really did come together is that they both firmly believed in the importance of education for women and women's causes. And not necessarily very liberal things like voting. I mean, that's kind of crazy, but they did share a lot of commonalities and came together in several ways. Yes, and so the next slide will show where they first met. And they met at... Judy and Mary. Oh, yeah, well, where she and Mary. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought we were talking about... Um, sorry, miscommunication. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, so this next slide is where Mary and Eleanor first met at Eleanor's home, a home that Sarah actually had built for them, for her, her and her husband, for Eleanor and her husband. And you'll notice that there's only, there's one door, it's a beautiful townhouse, isn't it? It's wonderful. Um, she sure. built this for them for their wedding, right? Their wedding gift. The only thing is that when you went into that front door, it's really two townhomes. She lived in one, and she gave it to them in the other. And then she had all these secret walkways. And to, so at any room in Eleanor and FDR's house, she could pop up <laughs> and say, hey, <laughs> I'm here. Uh, but this is where Eleanor and Mary met at a 
uh, luncheon that Sarah and Eleanor have put together for all the women in the country. Well, not all, but women in the country who were the heads of women's organizations. And they wanted to bring together women of like mind to speak about um, issues of women and educating young girls. And so Mary was invited by Sarah. Sarah had met Mary and she knew about the Thune Cookman. It wasn't called that at the time, but she knew about the school. She wanted Mary to be part of it. The only challenge was Mary was the only person of color in the room. And the other women were not sure they wanted to even sit down with her. That's how the book opens. And I want you to know when you read that first few scenes in the book, that really happened. We couldn't even make that up if we tried. But what happened was those two women began to bond because of that day. Eleanor was very impressed with how Mary handled it. And um, Mary, she was just so impressed. And Mary loved the way that Eleanor um, came to her assistance as well. And so they began to bond. And over the years, a few years passed, they would write letters to each other. They would travel across the country and see each other in various cities. And they became closer and closer. But the only challenge was they were becoming closer during a time of segregation and Jim Crow. These were two women who were becoming dear friends, and they could not even find a place to eat together. And a lot of people think that that was only going on in the South. Well, it was by law in the South, but it was by practice in the North. And New York was called the Jim Crow of the North. You know, isn't that something people didn't know? Well, not people. I didn't know that. I didn't know that until I started researching it, and I'm from New York. But they, even though they had challenges, they did just push through. And there was one place where we believe they came together and finally said, we're not going to put up with this anymore. We're going to be able to meet together, eat together. And Eleanor chose the Mayflower Hotel in Washington, D.C. Now, the Mayflower should have been a hint <laughs> that that's not quite where you want to take your black best friend. <laughs> but it didn't matter. The two women handled it. Um, and that was the Mayflower. We even had a chance to go and visit ourselves. So these two women were becoming closer and closer as, of course, they had many roles in their own lives, which we've told you about. What we didn't mention was in the years leading up to FDR actually becoming president, Mary was serving on appointed commission positions under various presidents. So they were meeting in Washington, D.C. and other places. And Eleanor had much to her chagrin, become the first lady of New York. Um, despite the fact that he had sort of initially sworn off politics when he came, came down with polio, FDR decided he did want to enter the political realm. Eleanor was not thrilled about that, as you can imagine. Um, but then when he was invited to run for president, she really became a reluctant first lady. You can kind of see her face there. Um, you know, she felt as though, you know, she had carved out this really unique life full of purpose for herself. And she was concerned that if she became the first lady of the United States, she would have to give all that up. All her independence, all her social causes, um, some of her special friendships. Um, and But she did ultimately decide that because she believed FDR was the right and best person to help lead the country through this, this beginnings of the Depression, she did stay by his side and campaign with him, although she never let anyone forget that she wasn't happy about it. <laughs> You see her face. This is this is the inauguration. She's not what I would call thrilled in this picture. If you can see her face, um, but one of the things that she decided at this time, um, a very dear friend of hers, which we can talk about if someone asks, somebody named Lorena Hickok, um, said to her that um, you know she, this was a reporter who had covered several presidencies prior to that. She said, you know, there's no rule book for being the first lady. 
Um, and of course, there was no rule book because no one ever thought a first lady would ever do anything besides host tea parties, right? So why would they have to set up rules around that? But Ellen used that failing to her advantage, and she carved out a role like no other first lady that came before her and probably after her. One of the very first things she did was loop in her very, very good friend, Mary McLeod Bethune, and they started to see what they could do together. And so one of the first things they did was to get a lot of black men appointed as advisors to FDR's administration. And um, if you look at this picture, here are the advisors and look who's front and center. <laughs> there is one real woman in the room. And she was actually in charge of all of these men. She was the one that helped get them selected, get them their positions, and she made sure they stayed together, even though they fought against it sometimes. But she also had a very important role. She was the senior director of Negro Affairs for the National Youth Agency. That was a position that FDR, after much urging from Eleanor, uh, gave to Mary. And just to go very quickly over what the NYA did, remember this is all part of the New Deal. Remember this was during the Depression. And the one thing, black unemployment at that time in some cities was as high as 60, 70, 80 percent. And one of the things that she did was to make sure that thousands and thousands of young black people got training so that they could get special jobs, vocational training, as well as educating them. They started a college fund, a college program that educated 4,000 young black people. So she was very concerned about education being the great equalizer and making sure that young African-American youth got a full chance. At the same time, she was still running the National Council of Negro Women that was becoming more and more powerful, especially politically. This is just one of Mary's many, many undertakings, um, together and separate from her dear, dear friend, um, Eleanor Roosevelt. I'm going to just give you some highlights of other things that these women did, things that you may be familiar with, but you may have had no idea that these two women were responsible for it, whether it was behind the scenes, kind of utilizing whatever influence they had from whatever angle, or in front of the camera, the press cameras, um, these two women were trying so hard to move the needle um, and really, in many ways, laid the groundwork for the civil rights movement. Um, I'm, and as I do this, I'm just going to sc scroll through all these wonderful pictures of the two of them. Um, one of the things that happened very soon after FDR became um, president, well, in 1933, um, there were 28 people lynched, black people lynched in the United States. Um, it was an urgent present matter that needed to be addressed. I mean, it had to have been addressed, right? It needed to be addressed and should have been addressed. Up until this point, there had been something like 3,000 um, Black people lynched during during this time period. But Eleanor really didn't, uh, For it's kind of unbelievable, and it was kind of unbelievable to me how little she actually knew about lynching. She assumed it was something that happened in the South. She was assumed that it was something that had happened in the past, right? She didn't think it was something that was still so prevalent. But in 1933, right after her husband was became president, there were several high profile lynching cases, George Armwood and Claude Neal. And this really raised the stakes. And at this time, there was a um, oh, sorry, we went too far there. Um, there was a bill being uh, presented by two senators, Costigan and Wagner, an anti-lynching bill. And Mary and Eleanor worked so hard to get FDR to back the bill. Without his backing, there was really no way it was going to get go forward. And this is one of the few areas where they didn't they didn't succeed fully um, because he needed the backing of the Southern Democrats to put forward all of his New Deal legislation. He would not 
publicly endorse this bill. And so, of course, it failed. Um, but he did, with their urging, he did publicly um, decry lynching, which is something that no president had done previously. But even still, an anti-lynching bill was not passed until 2018 if you can believe it. Um, but these women had more success with lots of other things they did. They had so much success with the educational endeavors that Victoria mentioned, as well as lots other ones inside and outside the New Deal. As the country um, started to prepare for war, um, World War II, these two women um, came together to work every angle to ensure that Black Americans had opportunities to contribute meaningfully in the war if they so chose. They, um, they made sure that there was black officer training programs. Um, they made sure that the Women's um, Army Corps admitted black women as well. They wanted to ensure that um, the black population was not relegated to roles as cooks and cleaners, that they had the opportunity to really serve in a meaningful way if they wanted to. Um, the, the last thing I'm going to tell you about is something that's not going to sound maybe as, as exciting as some of the other ones, but they in some ways are much more meaningful. Together, again, behind the scenes, they made sure that several presidential orders were, um, were enacted. And these orders ended exclusion and discrimination of black, um, black people in the armed forces and the defense industries during World War II and beyond. And these presidential orders became the basis for desegregation much more widely and for um, the political foundation for the civil rights movement. But one of the things that we love to talk about um, is that th th these two women did that weren't specific acts or making sure legislation happened, is that they wanted to normalize equality. They took every opportunity they could to speak at each other's conferences, to present awards to each other, to dine together. And I mean, if the press corps happened to arrive because somebody called them, well, could we help that? Every chance they get to shake each other's hands, stay at each other's homes, have the entire um, American population see these two women together, they took it. Okay. And then you may want to click to the next one. Sorry, I always forget. <laughs> and so one of the biggest things that they did was with Marian Anderson. Um, and I don't know if you know the story, but this was major. Marian Anderson was a renowned um, soprano singer at the time. And she had been asked by Howard University in Washington, D.C. Uh, to come and to do a fundraiser. And they wanted to do it in Constitution Hall because that held, it was a huge hall and held 4,000 people and they'd be able to raise enough money. At that time though, the Constitutional Hall was owned by the Daughters of the American Revolution. And so when they went there, they were like, no, we're not doing this with Marian Anderson, she's black. And so Eleanor Roosevelt, who was a member, said, oh, I'll take care of it. You know, I'll go there. I'll tell them, you need to do this. We're going to do this. So Eleanor told them, we're going to do this. And they told her, no, we're not. And she was so upset and so astonished by the whole thing that she um, got rid of her membership with them very publicly, didn't want to have anything to do with them. But they still needed to have this concert. They still wanted to make this happen. So they had to find a new venue. <laughs> they went to the Washington Mall. And that's where they had her, where one cold Easter morning, 75,000 people, black people and white people, young people and old people, stood together shoulder to shoulder to hear Marian Anderson sing. And think about that. The Daughters of the American Revolution were trying to stop 4,000 people from seeing her. 
and 75,000 people showed up. What they were trying to do for bad, something good really happened. So do you guys have a sense of why when we discovered their friendship, we were so excited to shine the light on it and kind of bring it out from the shadows, right? Um, For us, it was not just about their unbelievable accomplishments, but it was also about their friendship, right? And the more we looked into their story, the more um, we saw these two women who came from different worlds, even though they were similar um, in many ways, through difficult, frank conversations and shared passions, became the best of friends and the best of allies, really like sisters in many ways. But how did we come to write the actual book that we wrote here, right? Um, And it really started um, in, of course, writing this book, right? Um, The story, for those of you who don't know it, thank you, um, is the story of this amazing woman, Val DaCosta Green, personal librarian, to J.P. Morgan. This is the Morgan Library. Here's just a little glimpse of its pretty inside. I love that. Um, she uh, not only was ran this institution for four decades, she also became one of the most powerful people in the art world. But she could only do that by hiding her true identity as a black woman and passing as white. Because her father is this man, um, Richard T. Greener. We talked about him last time when we were here. Some of you might remember. He was the first black professor at University of South Carolina. There's a huge statue of him right across the street, practically. Um, And as we were delving into this book um, and having difficult conversations about race ourselves in a time period of racial unrest in our country, you know, we, we wrote this and edited it during COVID and during the time of George Floyd, Um, this friendship seemed really resonated with us. It really seemed as though in some ways they were stand-ins for us um, and could provide a roadmap of friendship between races. Yeah, and so there were plenty. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shorten this a little bit so we can have time for questions because we're running out of time. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I don't even look at the clock. I do apologize. <laughs> so, um, but we had many discussions. Aww. Oh, so cute. Oh, that's too cute. So cute. Um, we just, there were so many times when we had to have discussions that were really hard and we didn't even understand what was going on with each one of us. There were things about race that we didn't understand. Like there was one scene, um, and I'm going to try to make this short because I really want to keep it open for questions. So um, there was one scene where we had, I had written something and Marie kept putting it back in and I kept taking it out and she would put it back in. Yeah. And I would take it out. (laughs) Um, It happened about four times. And I realized at that point that I wasn't just a woman of a fantastic agent forgetting to take it out. I, she kept putting it back in. And before I called her up to ask her, why is she putting it back in? I had to know why I wanted it out. And it was a situation where Mary McLeod Bethune in the very first scenes, without telling you too much, um, goes to a really bad time with with women who don't want to sit down and break bread with her. Uh, but in a couple of scenes later, a few years later, I wrote a scene where she is very well accepted by um, white people in Florida. And so Marie wanted to add a line that said, with Mary thinking, if these women could see me now. And I kept taking that out. Um, because I was thinking she wouldn't think that and she kept putting it back in and finally we discussed why I wanted it out and I wanted it out because Mary wasn't thinking about something that happened two years ago because between when it happened and that new moment two years had passed she had suffered from 18,742 other microaggressions And she didn't have time to think about each and every one of them. You can't look back. You'll never be able to look forward. And when I called you and told you about that, it was like an epiphany. For the first time, even though we talk about racial issues 
a lot in Victoria's personal experiences, historic and modern, not that she's historic, mind you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell we're punchy? <laughs> um, I, for the very first time, I felt the weight of the microaggressions. I don't think until that moment, I really understood, oh my God, like here was this thing that happens at the beginning of the book. And I just assumed that it would still be weighing like an albatross around Mary's neck. But guess what? So many similar things had happened in the meantime that she, it wouldn't have even been in her mind at all. And that conversation and that process, that, that part of the writing process was completely transformative for me in understanding what the, not just what Mary went through, but what Victoria goes through and what so many black people in our country go through. Yeah. So this is our favorite part of oh, the pro. Oh, you want to say just, just one, one thing. other thing? Okay, sorry. Leaders. Okay. I'm going to say one quick thing. And that is that the other thing that got, went into this book was you. These conversations, the questions you ask at all the events that we've done since um, the person, in person and virtually since the, per the personal librarian came out, have worked their way into, the, into our conversations and the pages of our books. Um, the exchanges that we have, the things you know and don't know, the questions you ask, the difficult things that you raise, raised our awareness of what these women would have discussed and dealt with and what we need to discuss and dealt with so that we can bring it back to you in the pages of the personal librarian. Questions? <laughs> Sorry, I just had that. We'll, we'll open up. We got two mics. We'll try to close both sides. Hello. Is that one working? No. Hello. This one works, I think. I'm going to borrow one. Yeah, these work. <laughs> it's me. It's me. Was it working when I was using it? Yes. Okay, so this one's working, I think. Is it? Is it? It's work. Well, we gotta have one work. Hello, hello. This is what this one's working. Let's just use this one. He's a curse. Sure. So the question is, how did we start writing these books together? Now, this one wants to be really loud to compete with the other one. Um, it started with Belta Costa Green. Um, many years ago, when I was still a commercial litigator in New York City, a job I loathed, um, I would sneak out to the cultural institutions in New York. So I'd always loved history um, and that, that sort of dark corners, the, the things that people didn't know. And when I was at the Morgan Library, which was a place, a place I liked to go, a docent mentioned Belta Costa Green to me. Now, I will not tell you the year, but this suffice it to say it was several decades ago. And at that time, I found Bell to be fascinating, but I didn't know, and nobody really knew at that time, that she was actually a Black woman passing as white. It was several years, if not decades, until we actually knew that for certain. And when I learned that, of course, she became a million times more remarkable, right? Um, and I also knew that I really needed, wanted to have a Black woman tell her story, too. Uh, Bell had to hide her identity for 
basically her whole life um, in order to have the, the role and the success that she did. And she deserved to have a black woman tell her story. And as a white woman, I can, and a fiction writer, I can imagine a lot of things and I do, but I really can't imagine what it would be like to be a black woman in our country. And I, and I knew that I wanted a partner. And it was at that time I read Victoria's award-winning novel, Stand Your Ground, which I highly recommend to everyone here who has read it. Um, thank you. Applause it deserves. Um, it is, takes a, a horrible issue in our country and examines it from the perspective of the women, one white, one black. And that book just, uh, you know, I read it and I thought, will she want to write this Bella DaCosta Green book with me? I don't know. And so her agent reached out to my agent and my agent just gave me a three page proposal that Marie had written up and my agent didn't tell me anything. She just said, read this. Um, and so the first thing I did was look up Marie Benedict, I, I hadn't known her, and when I Googled her, I saw that she wrote wonderful historical fiction about women who've been lost in the flows of history, but I wondered what that had to do with me. I'd written 30 contemporary novels, and then I saw a picture of her, and I wondered if she had ever seen a picture of me. <laughs> I thought she had the wrong Victoria Christopher Murray, but I checked it out. They said, okay, she knows she's black, okay. <laughs> but then I start seriously. That was that was took the first month. I was like, she she called the wrong person. But then um, I I started reading the first page of it, and it was all about J P Morgan, and I wasn't interested in J P Morgan. So I would pick it up and put it down, pick it up and put it down. Um, and my agent would call and say, "Did you read it?" And I was like, "Oh, I'm so busy." And about three months passed, and my agent said, "Nobody's that busy. Can you read it? <laughs> it's three pages." And so. I read the first page about J.P. Morgan, and I still tell him. The second page got a little bit more interesting. It was about this woman named Belle Costa Green, but I still wasn't interested. Not until the last paragraph that said, and no one knew that Belle Costa Green was black until she passed away. I said, are you kidding me? We could have saved three pages in three months. <laughs> if you had just started that, what was that? Okay, first of all, how flattering is that? <laughs> I've told her that a million times. And the second thing is, I would like to say it was actually six months. <laughs> it was so long that I called the agent and said, I, I'm guessing Victoria passed on working with me. But I learned a lesson, put the lead first. <laughs> Hi, ladies. Hi, I talked to the school for 10 years, so I'm pretty loud. <laughs> First of all, thank you for highlighting Mary Bethune McLeod because that's a South Carolina, South Carolina yeah. lady. You know, she's very important to us, and you putting her on the national stage this way is very honorable. Today. Yay for Mary! I love her. Okay. My question is now, with a personal librarian, we didn't have as much personal information because, you know, she was passy. Yeah. So what, how did writing this contrast with writing a personal librarian when there's so much information about both figures? And that's a really good question because there's so much information, you don't know what to put in and what to take out. And we actually had to take out like, a good 10, 20% of the book after we had finished reading it because it was just, we didn't think you would want to read 1,682 pages. Um, so, so, but it was much easier in terms of the information being out there. I went down to Bethune Cookman. I um, was able to, I know, knew the president of Bethune Cookman and was able to get in there, went to her home, met with her, her grandson had, had self-published a book. And so I read that everything we needed was in that book. And then his daughter w works at Bethune Cookman. So I met her, um, read as many biographies, even though they told me to stay away from those that they had all the information there uh, as I could on her. And it was just what information we were gonna put in and what we were gonna be able to leave out. And the same with Eleanor, right? I mean, again, like Eleanor Roosevelt, how many books are there on the Roosevelts out there, right? Um, there are, you know, monuments and museums. There's the FDR library. There are archives. And yet, there's almost nothing about their friendship out there. 
I think our book is, is the first book about it fiction or nonfiction, um, as you can imagine, in an era of segregation, it wasn't exactly reported on in the mainstream press. Um, we used the black newspapers extensively to track their movements, see what they worked on together, because of course you could find it there. Um, there were some archives, uh, some of Eleanor's archives, which are kind of definitely in the FDR library, but also scattered around. We were able, through kind of spending many, many hours in my local library's microfiche machine, which I think I was the first person to use in 20 years, um, spending hours and hours pouring through archives, we were able to piece together letters between the two women or the CCing them on projects that they were working on. So it was really, while there was a ton of stuff, there was also not enough stuff. You know, it was a very unusual situation of too much and not enough. Um, and we really were, we feel like, able to reconstruct so much of their friendship. And yet, you know, that, that, all that research is the architecture of the story. And there's so many um, areas where we don't know what happened. But we really felt like in some ways, again, we do not think, we, we are not delusional. We do not think we are as cool as Byron McLeod Bethune and Eleanor Roosevelt. But there are some parallels between their friendship and ours and in the conversations that they have. And we were able to kind of fill in those grayer areas with a mixture of facts, logical extrapolation, and our own personal experiences. Thank you. Um, I'm curious about the title. First ladies, obviously Eleanor was the White House first lady. Mary Bethune was the first lady of civil rights? Or we are about to find out. <laughs> first of all, it's in the book, but uh, there's a really interesting... Yeah, because if you Google her, you'll always see first lady of the struggle. First lady of the struggle. So you that's, that's something that's out there. I don't know if I want to tell you how she got it. <laughs> Can I just say this about it? Okay, so you have to read it to figure out how she got it. But but Victoria we, we discovered it almost when we were completely finished with the book. And it, I'm not going to tell you what it is, but it was some deep digging. And we knew we, knew we were going to call it the First Ladies because we liked the First Lady of the United States and the First Lady of the Struggle. But we always wondered, where did she get that name? And it was at the 11th hour that Victoria found out. And I leave it at that. <laughs> Except I called you saying, oh, I know, it was crazy. We couldn't believe it. Anyway. Hi, Victoria. Hi. Jan. Hi, Jan. How are you? I'm great. How are you? Good. I haven't seen you in a while. I, she read my first book. She was like my biggest fan with my first <laughs> book. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, you too. Okay. So good to see you. Um, I may be putting the cart before the horse, but I'm going to ask the question anyways. Um, the two of you collaborated on two books, okay? Is that an anomaly, or are you already working on something else, or have you considered working on something else beyond these two? We already signed the contract, girl. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Oh, well, who would love to be able to? No one would be more excited than us. But we are not permitted to yet because we're still in final discussions about the parameters of the story with our with our publisher. But we can say this: the topic will through the lens of historical women, explore these kinds of issues again. We want to give all of you a safe place to land in, in these books and in these conversations that these books hopefully prompt and generate. And um, 
but and it'll be a little different. Everything's a little fresher each time, um, but we can't say exactly what it'll be. Sorry. I do want to be, talk a little bit more about what Marie just said. The reason we purposely chose the first ladies, you know, Belle de Costa Green, we thought we were just writing a book about this wonderful woman. And I always say that at the end of it, I, I really liked Marie. I would have sent her Christmas cards if I mailed them out. But then during, during the process of editing and everything, and we were doing it during the summer of 2020, we were living, writing a book about race, living in the middle of upheaval. And I had never in my, and we talked three hours every day working, and I had never in my life had such deep conversations, not with anybody in my family, not with my best girlfriends, nothing like the conversations I had with this woman here. And she became my sister. I mean, we cried together. We laughed together. I had to stop her from going up to Central Park because I didn't have enough money to bail her out. <laughs> I mean, it was just, it's been such a wonderful relationship, but because of that now, we talk constantly about race. I mean, if anything happens to me uh, it, and, or anything she happens to her, some of those things that have happened made their way into the book. And so what we want to do with all the books we write from now on is we're on a mission to get black people and white people to be able to have the kinds of conversations that we are blessed to have. And do you want to tell me? Oh, yeah. Okay. So we, yeah. So a really good example of that um, happened like two nights ago, two nights ago. So, you know, we are choosing these topics because of course we want to celebrate these women's legacies, but the process of, of their lives and the, and the things that they have to go through means that they're having very difficult, frank experiences and conversations like Victoria I did, as she, uh, Victoria and I do, as she just said. Um, and so we, we really encourage and want people to have those same thoughts and thought processes and discussions, whether it's in a book club or with a friend or with someone who you just happen to pass in the street who's carrying the same book around, right? Um, and we were at, we did an event in Maryland two nights ago. I'm sorry, every day is blending into every other day. I think it was two nights ago. And a woman, a white woman in the audience, um, a beautiful big audience like this one, raised her hand, little first question. first question, little tentative, and started it off by saying, I, I don't I don't want to offend anybody, but I noticed in your I think it's the author's notes, um, at the end of the book, you it, this is a question I've always wondered about, she said. Black people is capitalized and white people is lowercase. And why is that? And it was really interesting because that was a conversation that Marie and I had because it kind of looks weird on paper. And I was like, why is black capitalized and why is white lowercase? And I didn't have a good answer. And we were just told that it was a stylistic thing that everyone was doing. But I'm writing a book, of my first solo historical fiction project. And I'm writing about the Harlem Renaissance and I came across something that the very first time that ever happened, because haven't any of you ever wondered about that? You know what? And I came across the very first time that was asked or demanded was by W.E.B. Du Bois. Can you believe it? It was all those years ago when he wanted Negro, because it wasn't black then, capitalized, because he said that that is just one way to get us to feel like we are capital people in this society. You've been capitalized all your life, let us be capitalized. Um, but then I continued reading because that was very interesting to me. And then what it really is now is that white is lowercase because it's skin color. It tells the skin color. But black is more than that. Black is the culture. 
it is the black culture. So you wouldn't lowercase Italian American. So you won't lowercase black. Does that make sense? Does that make sense why that's happening? It still looks rather crazy on paper. But the thing is, is that at least we can all understand the origins instead of wondering why is that there to, is it there to divide us? And it isn't. But we all had that question. And I felt it was just wonderful that she felt safe enough to ask that question of us because she was asking it under a book. You know, fiction and these sorts of conversations, we hope, our goal, of course, is for everyone to feel comfortable asking those hard questions. You know, should, this woman was a little hesitant asking the question, but she felt safe oh, enough. Yeah. Because yeah. a lot of white people would like this. Yeah, very uncomfortable. <laughs> Oops, what just happened? I was so grateful for that question. Absolutely. And that's what we want. We want hard, difficult conversations, questions to be, this to be the place where they can be welcomed. Hello. Hi, Victoria. It's Gabby. Um, I don't even know you live here. But that's I don't live here. I'm here on vacation. Oh, yes. You were here, you know, I had to come, had to come see you. you know. um, I'm used to writing um, Lady Jasmine, yeah. Saints and Sinners. It's all juicy. Is there some juice in here? Oh, a little oh. bit of juice. Oh, did you read the personal librarian? No, I didn't get a chance to. I had it, but I haven't read it. There's nothing but juice in there. Really? Okay, I'm listening. I'm sorry. But I just wanted, you know, something about that juice in, in, the, in the personal librarian. So y'all know the scene, the very first time that Belle and Bernard got together. So the very first time, the way we write our scenes is one of us write it and then we give it to the other one to, you know, go in. So Marie was going to write that scene. Mm -hmm. The very first time Belle and Bernard were together. Yeah, girl, you're right <laughs> up. <laughs> so Marie's scene said, you know, they kissed outside the hotel room, they went in, and they woke up the next morning. No, ma'am. I wrote it. So yeah, I mean, I, you know, the thing that's so interesting about that question, Gabby, is that I'm still the same writer. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure. Oh yeah. You know, yeah, I can get started tonight. <laughs> I, we like to say that um, I use the ellipses and Victoria connects the dots. Always. <laughs> All right, one last question. Well, Clark's got the mic. Clark gets to the side. <laughs> oh, pass the buck. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Hi. I just saw you in the hallway. My name is Dana Matheson, and I work here at Richmond Library. I wanted to know, Victoria, your, a series of your books were made into movies at Lifetime. So will either of these or any future books that you write together also be turned into movies, possibly? So that's a good question. You know, we don't really have anything to do with it because you didn't, unless you have a spare twenty million dollars sitting around. <laughs> could you? So really, we don't. The people have to come to us um, who have the money. And so, with the personal librarian Al Roker Entertainment has optioned it to become a mini series. <laughs> So we just hope so, you know, but it has, we don't get to decide. And, but if you have an extra $20 million, we'll do it all day long. We would love it if someone in this going once, going twice. No. Okay, so we want to have plenty of time. One more round of applause. Oh, thank you all so, so much.
This has been such a delight and a treat. Yeah, as always. Thank you so much. Thank you all for being here. You're a fantastic audience. Thank you. All right. So we're going to whisk, we're, here's that one, one piece of note before you start moving around. We're going to whisk them over. They're going to be in the uh, 